video. Uh, very excited to have everybody on today. I like your new background, Catherine. Well, uh, I am on the shoreline and I will be speaking today to Captain Ron Savage, who is on his boat. Uh, I decided to be on the shoreline, so I had better Wi-Fi, but uh, Dr. Savage is on his ship right now and will be coming from the Florida coast. Welcome to Oxyfault Saw's first say. Welcome to Casual Conversations. This is our 21st episode, and I'm very excited to have Ron Savage with me. Hello, Ron. Hello. Uh, uh, thank you for having me on, uh, obviously, but it's, it's not a ship. It's, it's just a boat. A ship. Even though I would invite everybody, if you're down in Sarasota, Florida, and, and you want to talk more about brain injury, just look me up. I'm at Marina Jackson, Sarasota, usually. But I'm not traveling around, so open invitation. Well, welcome, welcome to our show today. And the first part of our show is generally talking about how the person that I'm interviewing got into brain injury. So I'm interested, how did you get, what, what how old were you and what time, how did you get started in this field? Um, uh, for, for me, and I, I, I sent you a photo of um, this, this uh, young man, Lenny Burke. Uh, there's been a book written about him, but uh, after, and, and, and I'm so happy that Marilyn um, Spivak is on, um, but with, um, uh, in, in my beginning, uh, Marilyn had already started up the National Head Injury Foundation, and, um, and what she was trying to do is to uh, get other states to start to uh, develop programs and uh, state associations and those types of things, and I happened at the time uh, I was in special education, uh, teaching back and we're going back a long time in the you know, 1970s, but in um, uh, 1979, uh, a young man named Lenny Burke was injured in a basketball game. Lenny was actually the uh, leading scorer in the state of Vermont, a small state, but he, had, he was, a, he was a very skilled basketball player, but he had also been uh, already accepted to uh, Harvard, Yale, and Dartmouth. I mean, he was a very brilliant young man. And on a drive down the basketball court, after he stole the ball up in the air, he got upended by another player and went down and crashed into a wall and sustained a very uh, severe uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, that, that was sort of the start of, uh, of it for my career in terms of uh, looking at him and then starting to work with his uh, mother in, in the community. And that's how we got connected to Marilyn Spivak. And so what happened out of that in terms of my own start is that um, we had, and I think it's, a, it's an interesting story, and Marilyn knows these stories well, but, you know, back in the day, nobody knew about traumatic brain injury, and we called it head injury at the time, but we raised a considerable amount of money in a small city, uh, well over $100,000 to send Lenny all the way across the country to Rancho Los Amigos Hospital, and everybody in this small city of 15,000 people, we thought that well, Lenny's going to go out there and he's going to get all this great therapy and he's going to come back and be Lenny Burke again. Well, he didn't. And, and not that it wasn't money well spent because at the time there were very few rehab places. However, when he came back, Lenny had, as, as, as we all know, with so many good people that we've all worked with, but the, the cognitive issues and social issues and all kinds of things. And um, that's how I got my start in it. And I, and I was asked by his mother to come in and work with Lenny because my background was in special education. But being honest with you, special educators didn't get any, any training in the traumatic brain injury. I know that, that Janet Tyler is, is on the Zoom call with us, but the, the first book in special education traumatic brain injury, Janet did, um, gosh, back in the early 1980s. I think she was only 15 at the time, but that was the first book that really came out. So we started to look at this a little bit differently. And then what happened um, uh, is that uh, Lenny's mother, Emmy Burke and I started the Vermont Head Injury Foundation under Maryland's guidance and became one of the state associations. So, so my entree into it was um, by just being in a certain place at a certain time. And I like to use right place at the right time because um, working with Lenny Burke was the joy of my life. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, a few years ago of cancer, 
Um, but it was it certainly started me on uh, looking at a population that was truly not only underrecognized but uh, underserved. So that's how I got going. Even to the point, I'll tell you one other little quick story. Um, those of you who've been working in the field for a long time, you know, it, this becomes a part of your life. And uh, my, my uh, youngest son, who is uh, in his 40s now, when he was four years old, he came home from preschool. And he said, Dad, he says, and he knew Lenny Burt because Lenny used to come over to our house. And my, my young son, Dave, said, Dad, I, I learned a head injury poem in, in preschool today. And I went, a head injury poem? What are you talking about? He says, yeah, listen, listen. And it went like this. Three little monkeys jumping on a bed. One fell off and bumped his head. Took him to the doctor and the doctor said, that's what you get for jumping on your bed. Now, it's a cute little, little poem. And here's my son reciting it to me. But the fact is, is that it's true. Because at the time, people would, would bang their heads hard, have head injuries. We'd take them to the doctor and nobody really knew what to do. And thank God that Maryland Spivak grabbed hold of this whole thing and not only started a, a national organization, but state after state after state. And, and that's, how, that's how it all grew. And that's how it grew for me through Lenny Burke. Would Lenny's injury now be considered uh, mild TBI, moderate or severe? Severe. He was in coma for uh, six weeks and uh, very slow recovery and uh, needed help and support uh, the rest, rest of his life, yes. Now, were people surprised that, that that kind of injury came in a basketball game? Yeah, they were surprised that it came in, in, in a basketball game versus a car crash or something like that. But again, the, the, the thinking at the time, and I'm not, I'm not, nobody knew any, any, any better. The thinking at the time was, well, Lenny's in coma. And everybody was holding, you know, you know, being vigilant and, and checking in the hospital and everything else. But Lenny's in coma. We expected him to wake up, ask for a cheeseburger and go home. Well, that's not the way it is. It certainly is not the way it is today. But, but back then, I mean, we, we learned, and I know Marilyn will agree with this, we learned so much. We learned so much from the people with the brain injuries and working with them. Um, and that's what really started to define the field because the, the science out was not out there before that, only a little bit. And those are from war victims. Um, well, and then from your original um, Lenny um, interaction, there was a transition and then you directed several, was it, were they centers for children, uh, like rehab centers? Yeah, you know, what, what happened is after working with, with Lenny, um, uh, I, you know, was ended up, uh, thanks to Marilyn again, I, um, Marilyn, uh, and I was started talking because at the time, a lot of the work of the National Head Injury Foundation, um, was, uh, really focused upon, uh, adults and, and, and I was interested in, in the children part of it. And so when we started to, to, I started to get involved and I was asked to sort of like start to build centers, run centers, set up rehab programs. Um, the first thing that a lot of us went through, and, and thanks for putting the, the, the definition up there. And for those of you, you you're going to see the, the date 1991. I know some of you probably were in elementary school back then, but um, we had to really better define brain injury. I remember it went from head injury to brain injury. And then we would, you know, in my world of special education with children, we certainly had some, some children that were born into the world with brains that didn't work as well as we would like them to work. And, but we also had children who had end up with an acquired brain injury that after they were born, something happened. And it could have been a car crash, it could have been a fall, it could have been a sports event, but it also could have been a stroke or an aneurysm or something like that or a brain tumor. So we started to better define brain injury and looking at that, not the traumatic brain injury side and whether it was a closed head injury or open head injury and then those non-traumatic brain injuries, which are still for the most part under-recognized, stroke in children, say, for example, or, or tumor resection and those kinds of things and what that does to a, to a child. So that was one of the things. The, 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 the second thing we did is we, we really learned a lot about the brain. And... Um, um, Catherine, I think you have a, a sort of a photo of a, a, a woman there with a brain, if you don't mind just putting that up real quick there. Um, we, we started to really understand 
And this is part of what I feel is sort of like redefining our, uh, how we're looking at brain injury. It was not uncommon at the time in rehabilitation. And you gotta remember Chicago Rehab Institute was ground zero for rehab, but it was primarily OTPT speech. Neuropsychology was just beginning to start to develop. And, but what we learned, we, we, we learned things about the brain. We certainly learned that if you hit certain areas, certain things are gonna happen. We certainly learned that you've got that primary injury and then afterwards that, that welling that are more damaging than the primary injury itself. So we learned all those things. But the other thing we learned, we really learned a lot about recovery. And, and I, I wanted to just to show everybody a kind of a quotation from Hippocrates because it's one of my, it's sort of one of my favorite things because even though, you know, we talk about brain injury and present day, et cetera, et cetera. Um, um, see, I don't know if you have that one, Catherine. Yeah, well, there, that, that this, this goes back to fourth century BC, obviously, and the, and, and the person who started uh, medicine, but uh, no head injury is too severe to despair of, nor too trivial to ignore. And the, and the reason I wanted to put that into this casual conversation today is because oftentimes, you know, when someone gets a traumatic brain injury, it is like, uh, it, it is a, almost an end of the world experience, end of life as people know it. Everything changes and everything else. But despite the severity, um, there are other good things. And I know many of you on the Zoom call have worked with people and are probably so impressed by how well they did, how they got back into the world, returning to work, returning to social, returning to families, everything else. And then on the concussion side, nor too trivial to ignore. Because in the beginning, well, you know, with Maryland starting the National Head Injury Foundation and other kinds of things, we, we certainly were looking at severe uh, traumatic brain injury more than the mild side because no one was looking at the severe. It's not like we were ignoring it, but we had so much work to do on, on the severe end and, and from a medical side and psychological and OTPT speech and everything. But we also have learned that, that, it's, that even these things that we call concussions, which are brain injuries, I'm gonna repeat that over and over again, that, that concussions are, sometimes we've, we've looked at those as trivial, uh, but we're finding out now that they're, they're not. And the last thing is, is a point I'll make in terms of learning from these large centers is, is the whole thing of that, the brain is a developing organ. And, and I, this is just a, portrait of a, you know, a little girl growing into a young woman and how the brain grows and develops and maturation, all those types of things. And I could go right up into the adult years because just because you're in your 20s doesn't mean your brain is through with development, if you will. I mean, those of us that you've gone through your 30s or your 40s, or your 50s know that your brain is still not necessarily adding new, you know, structures and fibers and neurons and all those kinds of things, but we, it's the maturation of the brain. Oops, too far. Too fast. Yeah, too fast. So when you start to look at how the brain matures, so what we learned there is that, and, and this is an important thing, um, you know, and I, again, I got to go back and give uh, Janet Tyler credit, as well as uh, Roberta Tapompe, Ann Glang, uh, Brenda Egan Johnson, Sharon Grandinetti. Uh, there's, there's a group of us that said, it's really interesting in brain injury, especially in young people, that it seems to be a developing phenomenon. In other words, you may get a brain injury at age four, but sometimes a lot of the deficits, more, more significant deficits, don't show up until your teen years. Or, or if we think about it this way, that you know, you, you know, you're going through school, you've had a brain injury, each year gets tougher and tougher. You know, fifth grade, on to sixth grade. You thought elementary school was tough, now try high school, try college. And so as, as the brain is injured very young, where we used to think that kids just bounce back from brain injuries, we now know that brain injury in, in children is a developing phenomenon. And I contend it's also a developing phenomenon for adults. I've worked with enough adults that have got injured in their 20s and 30s to see what happens to them over time because I've been doing this for so long and to see the changes in their, in their development. And, and I, I've got a, a, a person that I've, I've been seeing for a number of years now, and he's 62, and he was injured at age, age 40. And, and his likes and dislikes and those types of things, he's almost still uh, 
from a from a maturity point of view, he's almost like a, still like a forty year old. He he still hasn't developed some of that that more senior, if you will, adult thinking. He sort of got stuck in time. So that whole thing is is can be summarized pretty quickly. That that brain injury is not not this moment in time. It, it's really a lifetime experience. And, and that's where all of us need to reframe our thinking on brain injury. Because I know we see people at our point in time through kind of a microscope and we see them, we provide our, our treatment, our supports, whatever. But when you're with people with brain injuries for a long period of time, for a long period of time, you see this as a developing phenomenon. Now, that's maybe sometimes the downside, but the upside of this is we know we just don't get over it. We know we just don't come out of coma, ask for cheeseburger and go home. We know that younger children will experience more significant problems later on because those areas of the brain that were needed at age 18 were injured or damaged back at age four or five. And we certainly know the same thing in adults in terms of relationships, being able to hold down jobs, uh, endurance, fatigue, uh, concentration, all those kinds of things. So, but that's, that's what really I've learned from running these large large centers and having the, uh, uh, you know, the, the good fortune to serve um, so many people. It's really, we now really understand brain injury. Um, we have learned so much about brain functioning that we can apply to brain injury. We're looking at recovery now because can you recover from a brain injury? Yes, yes. Does that mean everything? Not necessarily, for sure. But if, if we do the right things, we're certainly gonna have better recovery than, than others. And then the last thing is, this is not a moment in time. We, we've got to hang on to these people for the rest of their lives. I lost your sound, Catherine. Oh. Sorry, that was me not unmuted. Yeah. So fascinating with what you were saying, I forgot to unmute. Um, I met you at Patrick's a school in New York City at the I Hope School. And yeah. at the time, I was trying to bring awareness for women versus men in brain injury. And it tied out very well with the work you had done where you were separating children from adults. Um, tell me about, and you, right away, you were very... Um, you got it because you had already seen this difference. So tell me about the hidden populations that you've been studying. Yeah, I think that, you know, ha having, and I, and I love running programs for people, but I also was amazed at where people that came into my programs came from. And you're gonna see a, a, a young woman I took a, a photo of and she was in a uh, locked uh, psychiatric facility. Now, this is, a, this is a young woman who had sustained a brain injury at, uh, at, at age eight. But by the time she hit into her, her, her high school years, she was diagnosed as conduct disorder and opposition defiant disorder and all kinds of things. And then she kept crashing and burning and having to go into psych facilities and be stabilized, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and a psychiatrist called me and they said, we've got a young woman here, Ron, and, and you know, would, you, would you take a look at her? And I went up there and looked through her medical records. And of course, here's this, here's this traumatic brain injury at a very early age, a very severe brain injury in a car crash. And um, I said, well, this must have some involvement with her. And since I'm running brain injury programs, I can, I can take her in. But if, if, when, when I started to look at other populations within that psychiatric facility, there were a number of adolescents in there that had prior history of brain injury. One young man had shot himself in the head and um, couldn't remember why he did it. And the young psychiatrist working with him kept saying to me, well, he's blocking, he's blocking, he's blocking. And I said, well, I've worked with young people who have gone through the windshields of the car and they don't remember that either. You know, he might not psychiatrically be blocky. He might not have ever stored that memory of, you know, shooting himself. And so when you start looking at it that way, then you start looking at, at um, uh, you can show that slide, people who were um, uh, women who were um, uh, abused, as have used done a lot of work in this area, Catherine, um, in, in terms of looking at uh, this issue. When I first looked at it, 
in uh, 19, uh, 1990, I went into three uh, centers um, for women. They were the domestic abuse shelters. And I went into three shelters and just asked, just interviewed, just randomly interviewed uh, women in there uh, to see how many had been hit and hit about the head. And, and the reason I like the slide is because, you know, you get the classic, you know, black and blue eye kind of thing, but you're hitting the head. And I was amazed at the number that were in those shelters that had not only been hit once, but hit several times. Um, and Catherine, you're, 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 you have a whole um, task force on this now that's working on it. We do have a task force uh, with Eve Valera, Angela Colantano, um, Kate Iverson, Lynn Hogg and Rachel Ramirez. And so we've done two years of monthly calls to connect the shelter first, first line of defense, the people that are working with um, women from gender-based violence and the brain injury researchers. So um, uh, Eve is on the call, so maybe she'll pop in later. She's a barking dog, so her sound is off. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, no, it's been re really important to try to connect the dots in this area. But that's, again, that's, that's another hidden population. Why, you know, I mean, my, my little going into three little shelters back in the early 90s was, was not a big deal. And maybe I should have followed up on it now that I think about it. But as you and Eve and others are finding out now, these numbers are huge. I also found the same thing um, in uh, special education. Now, again, I'm, it, it, before I was running, you know, a lot of the brain injury programs, working as a special educator, um, uh, I would look at kids with learning disabilities, attention deficit, um, you know, you name it, you know, whatever their qualification was for special ed. And in all of those symptoms, and I'll just stick with learning disabilities, it's basically defined by its symptoms. You know, the, the kid is having trouble reading, the child is having trouble doing math, the child... The kid can't pay attention long enough. You know, it's, it's, it's defined by its symptoms. Nobody looked at the etiology. In other words, okay, you have a problem with attention. You have a problem with learning. You have a problem with communication. Why? And so when I started looking into the educational records, there was nothing there. But then I got some families involved and started looking at the medical records, and I would hear those stories again. Oh, yeah, we were in a bad car accident, you know, and my, and my, my kid banged his head or my kid was on his bike and took a bad fall, or, and there's another one, enough of them, enough of them, all these stories type of thing, where I found so many kids in special education that had a prior history of traumatic brain injury. What, what happens, and, 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 and Janet Tyler and uh, Ann Glang and others have done great research on this. When we, when we started uh, um, contacting all the directors of special education in states across uh, this country, uh, every every director, state director of special ed said, well, this is traumatic brain injury is a low incidence population. But if you go over in the medical world and look at the CDC data, it's a big population, traumatic brain injury in children. Well, why is it so big in the world of healthcare and so small in education? And quite simply, it's because those kids end up with traumatic brain injuries. They come back into school, then they struggle after say a year, year and a half or so Everybody looks at the symptoms and says, oh, this kid has attention deficit. This kid has learning disabilities. Nobody looks at the etiology. So Janet and, and, uh, uh, and Ann Glang and others you know, looked into this, and, and that's basically what they found, that, that even though traumatic brain injury special ed is classified as a low incidence population, uh, it's, it's not. And, and you know, we can get into talking about uh, the people in, in incarcerated. I mean, the Texas studies, uh, uh, studies in other states, but the number of people that are incarcerated in our jails and have a history of, of head trauma. And I know some people will say, yeah, but they also were doing drugs and alcohol and doing stupid things and robbing stores. Well, people with traumatic brain injuries do have problems with drugs and alcohol. But that etiology, and I'll just keep hammering this, when you start looking at populations with needs, and I'll even throw out there people that have mental health concerns. Now, I know some people have had traumatic childhoods and there's certainly real mental health issues, et cetera, et cetera. But everybody that goes into and is screened for, for mental health issues, they should also ask that key question. 
do you have a history of head injury? Do you have a history of it? Because it may be a contributing factor. Or it may be adding fuel to the fire. So that's something I think in terms of, at least from my end, in terms of the, these hidden populations, there's a lot of people with brain injuries out there. And, and, I'll, and I'll finish with this, Catherine, but your work and Eve's work in terms of looking at this population of, of women and children uh, who have been uh, abused, repeatedly hit and everything else in domestic situations, I think that population is way bigger than we ever thought it was. And that, that's scary, that's scary. No, and, and absolutely. And, and, and credit to the first line workers in shelters that are literally trying to keep these women safe, um, in some cases men, and you know, keep them alive and keep them food and all the other pieces. But I do think that the recidivity rate, yep. people not being able to live, uh, you know, that will go back to an abusive situation has something to do with the brain injury. If that person is providing for you in a way that you can't provide for yourself independently. So, you know, yeah. it's very important. E Eve's typed here uh, that Ron went into shelters and the idea in the 1990s was amazing. I give him so much credit for connecting those dots and actually investigating. It's far more than almost anyone else did at that time. Thank you, Ron. That's from Eve. And well, let me, let me, and, and Eve, I appreciate the comment. Let, let me tell you just a little bit more about that when I went in there. The reason I was asked to go in there was because they did have some people that they knew had suffered head injury. And what they were saying to me is, you know, this, and I'll just say a 22 year old woman, you know, beaten by her house or her husband uh, or boyfriend or whatever. And, and we know she's got a documented head injury. What they were saying to me is, our treatment isn't working. Every time we sit down with her, we put it, counseling everything else, her memory problems are so severe that she doesn't remember from one session to the next. And so what they, they're asking me to do is, you know the brain injury side, we know the mental health side, how do we pull those two things together? That's why they, that, that's why they asked me in there. I wasn't you know, just sort of curious, I was sort of you know, kind of looking into this a little bit and, and again, surprised by the numbers. But when you think of it, there's a lot of people on that, um, whether it's, 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 it's the abuse side or it's the mental health side, uh, and I'll even go into the vets a little bit, because this is one of the things we did in New York City, is we trained up all the mental health counselors for, for veterans in New York City on head injury, because what they were finding is that their usual therapy milieu, their groups, their counseling skills weren't working as well because all, all of these, these, uh, uh, these veterans with head injuries had memory problems. They couldn't pay attention long enough to sit in a group for 45 minutes. You know, they got irritated very easily. So that, that's part of the problem in terms of pulling these things together, you know, and looking at the etiology, combining therapies. But you could sit with a mental health counselor for hours and hours and hours and not make any progress if you've got memory problems and can't remember one session to the next. So, so speaking of progress in the 45 years that you have in the field, um, where do you think we need to go, go next? Well, let, let, me, let me bounce to the concussion thing a little bit um, because you, you know, it is, um, yeah, just take that out for now. Thanks. It, the, the issue of concussions, because obviously, Catherine, your extraordinary work with pink concussions, looking at girls and women and those kinds of things. But, um, you know, when I was sort of preparing for this, I started to look back, you know, because I, I love the research. But in, 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 in 1907, in the journal from the American Medical Association, um, they made a statement that the, that the football is no game for boys to play. The risks outweigh the benefits. 1938, the Journal of School Health said they came out totally against football under the age of 16. 1957, the American Academy of Pediatrics said tackle football and boxing have no place in programs for children 12 and under. And I, I thought that was interesting from the concussion perspective because we have so many youth sports and that's when we first started really looking at this. I know with the NFL, you know, when Lee Steinberg dragged a bunch of us out to California in 1993 because his, his star quarterbacks were getting, you know, concussions and injuries. And, and that's how the, all the NFL stuff got going. And then Mickey Collins and Mark Lovell 
and impact and all that. That's how that all took over. And now um, I'll, most people know that in all 50 states, uh, in all 50 states, we now have uh, sports concussion youth laws. Limited. But we have not hit the point. We have not hit the point from 1907 that maybe kids shouldn't be playing tackle football. I got slammed one time on NPR when I said, I don't think kids under the age of 16 should be playing tackle football. Well, I was called un-American. I was told to move out of the country, you know, go to Canada. I said, well, they have football up there. Well, go somewhere else. I mean, I really got slammed for saying that, but, but I do think that's where our thinking needs to go. But that whole thing of looking at this thing regarding concussion, remember back to that definition, mild, moderate, and severe. Those are medical definitions. Concussion, brain injury, obviously a, a concussion is a brain injury. We, you, not, you need to look at the medical stuff, but you also need to look at the clinical, how it presents clinically, and you need to look at how it presents functionally. You know, one of, one of, my, uh, one of my favorite people, Harry Carson, who is a, a NFL linebacker for the Giants, he said, concussion, it's only mild if it didn't happen to you. And I think that's probably one of the best definitions of concussion. And, and, and I think that where we need to go with concussion before we get to some of the other things, we need to understand that one, a concussion is a brain injury. And Catherine, you may remember the, the, the young person uh, in, in Rome that, that did a great presentation. And then he was saying, you know, we should, we need, you know, with concussions, we need to get family involvement going and everything else. I said, I went up to mattress. I said, well, there's great research on, on brain injury in families. And he said to me, I'm not talking about brain injury. I'm talking about concussion. And I went like, uh-oh, we're in trouble. And I say this, and I know some people probably will sign off now, but a lot of the people doing concussion work do not know the literature in brain injury, nor the history. And it really bothers me because a concussion is a brain injury. You need to know that literature. Even though we plowed ahead with severe and modern stuff first, all those things are applicable to the world of concussion. I think right now it's everybody is running to the trough um, like, they, like we did with other disabilities sometimes and, and not really looking at it. But that's- well, And I think what I've ahead. seen from the sports world is that you know college people, people studying college players are like, wow, there was a high school history. And then people that are studying high school, like, oh, there was a middle school history. And then people, well, there isn't really organized sports at the time in, in elementary school. Now you can you know, play on an international team in, in elementary school. But I think the sports people keep backing up, realizing that they aren't black boxes, that everybody comes with a history. And I think they went smack into the pediatric brain injury. People are like, we've been studying brain injury for a long time. And I think those groups just have a little trouble meshing around the, the elementary school age. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And, and, and I also think that if you look at, I've read your papers, Catherine, on, on the work you've done with private schools, you know, because private schools don't come under the same rules and regulations sometimes as the public schools. And in, in, in private schools, a lot of private schools make the kids play sports. And, and, and in that situation, um, you can have some kids that are not very athletic be put in a sport and I'll just choose soccer. I went to a, a saw a, a kid who got injured in a soccer game the other day and it was a, a private school and they're playing a youth soccer match. These are 10 to 12 year olds, but they are playing with an adult size soccer ball, not a youth size soccer ball. Now, nobody on this Zoom call would take a basketball, throw it up in the, in the air and get under it and hit it with the front of your head. But that's what they're making these kids do. So no wonder this kid got a concussion. But I said to the coach, I said, you need to get youth size soccer balls. That's, that's the educational stuff I think is still not out there, but we have the information, we have the knowledge. So, but I'm, I'm hoping that concussion, you're going into the future and we'll, we'll talk about some of the stuff that, that um, uh, uh, Brett Mazel has done. Uh, but I, th I think concussion going into the future has got to take a much more um, exacting look. And if they keep themselves separated from the world of traumatic brain injury, they are going to miss a, a whole slew of great literature and research. So that's me pontificating. <laughs> pontificating. We but being old, being old, I can. 
uh, we have we have some questions starting. Um, are you ready for questions, or would you like? Well, let me let me let me. Can we go to the Mazel slide, and then I'll, I'll I'll take some questions and things. Because I would encourage people to just to sort of look at, at Brent Mazel's work. Um, if you have it, if you have it, it's, it's Brent Mazel and um, and Dr. Dewitt um, published this great article. But what they did is they they went through uh, a whole uh, medical uh, database and and looking at uh, at brain injury from a long term perspective. And the reason I say this because I think it's it sort of takes us into some of the stuff we need to look at in the future. But we, we certainly know, like with concussion, because we've already seen that there's a possibility of early dementia and Alzheimer's, but there's also, there's also these risks for psychiatric and neural behavioral problems. Uh, seizures, three times more likely in a person's had a brain injury than the general population. Neuroendocrine disorders, sexual dysfunction, musculoskeletal. But what Brent Maisel did and, and Marilyn, I know you, you remember this great presentation. He said, our problem with brain injury is we're still looking at, looking at it as an injury. He says, can we look at brain injury as a chronic medical condition? Can we look at it like we look at diseases? We don't look at brain injury like we look at cancer. We look at cancer differently. We look at cancer and the recidivism and what can happen long-term, everything else. We haven't been doing that with brain injury, even though the research is there on all these things long-term uh, developing uh, over time. So one of the things I think in terms of pushing us into the future, really pushing us into the future is start, stop looking through the microscope and start looking through that telescope and looking long-term here. And, and what we can do in terms of, of, of supports. I mean, I'm, I'm still waiting for that, that chip that I can put my, my left temporal area and kind of support my hippocampus, you know, as, I, as I'm getting older, you know, but, but all of that technology is coming down through. Um, Catherine, you saw in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the rehab school that we have in New York, how we use uh, unbelievable Toby eye gaze software and stuff. We're getting, we're getting kids with catastrophic injuries to respond and speak and move for the first time ever. These were kids that that were just sort of left at home or left in nursing homes because nobody thought you could do anything with them. But we know now, and I'll, and I'll promise I'll finish with this so we can do questions. We know now what to do with people with brain injuries. Now we don't know everything, but boy, I'll tell you, we know an awful lot. The issue is we don't have the money. And if anyone on this Zoom call has the money, to do you know, twice, three times as much money. If you had the money to really do what you know should be done, we would be so much ahead, so further, light years ahead. And, and, and as much as I, I still want obviously to see more research and science and all those good things to happen, we all collectively need to get on the, the Maryland Speedback bandwagon once again and push for that money to come. The money comes through CDC, NIH, et cetera, but the money comes from Congress. CDC doesn't make up their own money. It's Congress that says you can have this much. And, and I'm hoping that, that if people sort of buy into this mantra that we know what to do, we just need more money. If we can collectively start to go at Congress and say, put money into this population, we know what to do and we can make better lives for people. So let's do a few questions and I'll stop yakking away here. I absolutely agree about the money issue. And I've had a number of conversations with uh, large hospital system people and brain injury families don't give money in the same way that cancer families do. Um, right. It's just not lined up. And, and I think the costs of brain injury over time may be part of that piece, but the, oh, it'll come from some wealthy family that will take care of this does not happen in brain injury. And also there's so many spl splinter groups, you know, every day there's new, you know, advocate brain um, organizations. So I really do think it's a congressional effort that needs to be made and we, we can all do that together. Um, uh, Nat Dean has had her hand up for a long time do you want to, uh, oh, Marilyn too. So we'll do Nat, uh, Marilyn, then Eve. 
Nat, do you want to un un mic? Hi, thanks. Um, I just wanted to uh, suggest that we make it possible to have closed captioning on these meetings because a lot of us need that. So I've got Facebook open and I've got our Zoom open. And I think that if Ron could turn it on from his end, since he's using the play Facebook platform, I think, then we'd have better access. So this goes to access. Brain injury is a disability and requires access. And the more senses we can engage at once, the more successful we can be as survivors. And also advocates are better advocates when they come from the voice of experience or the platform of experience. So that's my, that's my, uh, that's, uh, I'm standing on my soapbox about that, <laughs> doing it a lot lately. Um, but uh, one of the things about funding, you're absolutely right. Go to Congress and get, sorry, get them to put the funding into the CDC and then funnel it out to the states. And also innovative programs at the state level, such as uh, New Mexico puts $5 as an added court fee on every moving violation that goes into the Brain Injury Service Fund, which then provides things that are not covered by insurance. And that service also automatically applies, helps anyone apply for Medicaid. And if the Medicaid program is available, then they get gain ex instant access to those programming uh, resources. But thank you, it's a great presentation, but let's try and be more accessible. <laughs> thank um, you. We were trying, uh, Mar Margaret was trying to get it up. We do know it's on Facebook, so we'll figure out how to get it working because it was enabled. We just don't know why it wasn't working. So I do apologize for that. In your yeah. Well, I'm, I've got a resource now by uh, putting, I have Facebook on the left side of my screen and the Zoom on the right side of my screen so I can still see who's here in chat. Um, and all of that, but it makes it very small on a 15 inch screen. Well, I'm and I, thank you so much. Okay, take care. Marilyn, hello. You need to unmute. First, you need to unmute. And if I remember, Ron was fishing the day you were on. He was what? Fishing? fishing? Yeah, remember he didn't show up for your show because he was. Fishing. That's right, Ron. Yeah, I just want to accept you do that. You better have caught a lot of great, great fish. Anyway, um, I just want to say something, Catherine. With that ship behind you, you look like the pirates are coming after you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ron, that was a great presentation. You brought back a lot of memories. And uh, I think there was a text that you may want to mention if people want to look it up is the Mark Ilvesacker. Um, he did a tremendous amount of work in the, or in the early days. He, he passed in the 90s, and that was a great loss. He was very young. Um, I just want to address someone's comment and your comment, uh, Catherine, about funding. Number one, um, I don't know how many uh, clinicians are on this call, but the issue when I addressed it on my talk is the importance of advocacy in Congress when you bring a person who had a head injury along with a clinician. The clinicians alone are, I've always felt, if they go in and advocate for money, they're going in to advocate for their program. When I go in, I'm advocating for the research, the service, um, the service reimbursement, the development of a program that I need for my daughter. And Dr. Savage is with me to provide the data and the science behind my request. So you need to, you need to share that approach. Uh, and I think one of the things that you said, Catherine, is the reason we've never been able to raise the kind of funds that other organizations that are directly known as a disease like cancer or ALS or MS or um, any, other, any other condition that is qualified as a disease. There's no issue for the most part of getting treatment and medication, et cetera, paid for. And I think the difference is that the families of, of anyone who's 
who sustained a brain injury at whatever level, getting the, the funds reimbursed and getting access to a service, getting access to a clinician who knows anything about brain injury, particularly in most of American um, rural areas or suburban areas. I'm out of Boston and we are quote, the medical universe or used to be with five trauma centers within five miles. Well, if you live in the Berkshires or you're out in Martha's Vineyard or you're in rural Massachusetts, you could be in rural Nebraska. It is very, very hard to find a service when you don't have a trained clinician. Ron addressed that consistently. It is a little better than it was in the 90s and the 80s. But if you go out and you uh, work with anyone in a rural state, you're gonna have a terrible time trying to find the expertise. So the issue is until we recognize brain injury at whatever level as a disease, a chronic disease beginning, the beginning of a chronic disease of any kind, it, it is not a single event. As Ron said, you don't have a head injury, wake up from a coma and ask for a hamburger. It doesn't go away. You have residual issues. Most people have residual issues, no matter what level of brain injury one incurs. So I, we've got a long way to go. We've come a long way in terms of science and understanding, but we have not come a long way in delivering what we know. Absolutely. And the, I was part uh, for three years running of a um, consortium, an academy of imaging people that included um, Fuji and GE and all the big manufacturers and organized. And then they had people to tell the patient's story, which came, concussions came up a number of years, and then researchers. So we were in teams, uh, GE, me, and somebody from BU, you know, Fuji, Mamas, Sugar Mamas, and you know another institution, and we, we would come into come into DC, have a morning together, and all had to go up to Capitol Hill. And like I was the fluffy story, and then the academic said his piece, and the uh, rep from GE said their piece, and we said give money, and it was a very con con uh, concerted effort to try to get money for imaging. So I've seen it done well. So I, I agree, agree that we just have to be more focused to try to get money in that way. Um, Ron, do you have any comments before I go to eat? Well, um, my one comment is that when uh, a group of us got together uh, four years ago and um, uh, under the guidance of Patrick Donahue, and we met in New York City for four days, and we developed a national plan for children, adolescents, and young adults. National brain injury plan, state to state, with budgets in each state and everything else. It, it was at the same time when President Obama put a billion dollars into autism. Not that it shouldn't be there, but he put a billion dollars into autism and said, develop a plan and let's see what we can do. Well, there's still not a national autism plan. The, our group, we gave the government the plan. We brought it around. Patrick and I paraded it around Washington, putting it in, in, in meetings after meetings after meetings, you know, trying to trying to push this. That the, the, the point of this, and some people have been commenting on it, the, the only way that you can move Congress is a, was a concerted effort. And you have to, and, and I agree with Marilyn, because I've seen it when we passed the special ed laws and TBI. If you have a concerted effort, the families have to tell their stories in a, you know, in a, in a hearing and the professionals have to be there to back it up. But when the professionals tell, or when the, when the families tell their stories, that's one of the best ways. And I'll just end with this. The pie is not divided equally. If you look at the amount of money, billions and billions of dollars that are put into AIDS, HIV, not that it shouldn't be there but we have way more people with traumatic brain injuries than there are numbers of people with AIDS and HIV. And that's because of their advocacy work. 
And, and that's, that's where brain injury is never, we just never been able to get to that level. But if we do, we are such a powerful force. We have so many people. We can march on Washington and make some changes. I want to give Eve a chance. We're sort of wrapping up our last 10 minutes. Eve. Hi. Nice to see you, Ron. Thanks so much for being here. I just wanted to make a quick comment about something in, with respect to brain injury and severity. And what, what I always sort of remind myself and try to say is the definition of a brain injury, whether it's a mild traumatic brain injury or a concussion or moderate to severe, is based on the immediate occurrence. So it's sort of based on if you've been unconscious for 30 minutes or more, if it's mild versus moderate or severe. It's not based on the outcome. And so, so basically there can be a huge disjoint between that initial name that is given the brain injury and what you actually are left with. And so for people who sustain mild brain injuries where they have persistent symptoms years down the line or in many cases, especially for the group of people that I work with, women who have experienced partner violence, repetitive brain injuries, most of which are mild. Again, you have mild brain injuries or concussions, but that's just based on that one incident. But as sort of been, sort of been alluded to by other people in, in you as well here, that does not really define what, what that means for the person, right? You have to see what ha you know what are the effects of that going down, and that's really what you have to pay attention to. And it doesn't really matter if it's a mild injury or a moderate or severe in many cases, because if you have repetitive mild injuries, that could be worse than a moderate brain injury, um, as it's as it's currently defined. And I think that's really important to think of when we try to figure out like oh should we pay attention to people with concussions or mild brain injuries or these repetitive injuries? Um, and, and obviously, you know, the, the data that have come out now, you know, now that, you know, it's been defended for so long that it wasn't a problem that, oh yeah, there might be a link between, you know, later neurodegeneration and repetitive concussive or subconcussive hits. Um, again, those were kind of subconcussive injuries at the time, nothing happened. But look what happened down the road. These people are, committing suicide, they have chronic traumatic encephalopathy, their, their lives are effectively ruined eight to 10 years after they've um, completed their career. So I, I just wanted to sort of piggyback on something you had referenced earlier, Ron, because I think that's an important point to remember. Yeah, I, I, and I, I concur. I mean, I, I think that when I had sort of said before that certainly the, the medical people, whoever sees that person first, the, they've got to use you know, they got to use their codes, they got to use medical codes, or they're not going to get paid, <laughs> you know, so they use their medical codes, and it gets into that mild, moderate, severe. But second to that, you know, you got all those clinical uh, uh, evaluations, OTPT, speech, neuropsych, etc. But it's that third one, it's that functional one, does the, is the person able to return to work? You know, what happens in terms of their family situation? Are they able to, you know, manage their kids anymore, or, or whatever? you know, the social situations, that stuff. You don't know that down the road. Where that comes out though, Eve, and I think it's interesting uh, in, in the legal world. Um, and again, I got to give, you know, you had Ken Copeland on and, and again, what Marilyn Spivak did is she brought the legal world into it because she didn't want attorneys going into a, a situation and just filing a lawsuit over a, uh, a mild brain injury so when we, when we looked at that differently uh, in terms of those cases, I did a little bit of expert work, but we looked at differently cases. We looked at not only what the, what the physician said, but what all the clinicians said, and then what all the family and friends said. If you pull those three, three, three things together, you got a good sense of, of what's happening in that person's life. But you can't just rely, like you said, Eve, you can't rely on the people that first see them, you know, Absolutely. Can't hear you, Catherine. Hi, sorry. Uh, who else had a question? I wanted to say hi to Elena Fong. Dr. Fong just joined us. We have been all over the world together, she and I. Um, anyone else have a question? Because I have a question if no one else does. Anyone else? 
Um, Ron, I just wanted to talk to you about the um, disparities um, for people of color and brain injury. And that's something that I'm trying to use my privilege and my platform on because uh, it has been a shortcoming in my organization um, to include um, people of all colors in our patient groups. And, and we recently started a women of color support group, um, which is uh, staffed and moderated all by women of color. I'm not in part of that group. Um, but, you know, how, how, any ideas for what we do with that, that your TBI outcome won't depend on the, uh, the color of your skin and uh, the issues with, again, prison being a place where many people with brain injury, especially of color, end up. Yeah, I, uh, just a, a couple of comments, you know, again, and this is just from my experience, 45 years running programs. Um, my, my programs uh, had uh, a, a diversity that was uh, equal to the greater catchment area that I was around. Um, but we found that some people didn't have access to services and supports simply because if they're a person of color, they may not have had uh, insurance benefits, say, for example, or whatever. And, and if I go way back, and again, I don't want to bore people, but my, my first uh, uh, adult, young adult brain injury programs were 90% men, very few women in them. And, and I went like, well, what is that about? So I think that part of this, Catherine, is, is an evolution of this. You know, you don't, you don't see it until you go looking for it. I, I didn't realize this whole issue of brain injury uh, and, and domestic abuse was as big as it is until we go, we go looking for it. Um, but I think that, that it's sometimes, I found in my programs, it was access to funding where people didn't get into my services, but people of color are, are injured in the same percentages as, you know, whatever the percentage is in that particular catchment area. And the only outliers in that, I think there are some populations, um, uh, there are some populations that don't sometimes take advantage of, of services and supports simply because they, it's, the culture is all wrong for them and they're not going to, they're not going to go there. And I've had, I've had family members keep their person, keep their, their young adult or their child home and, and care for them rather than to have them in a program because it, it, it just didn't fit culturally. So I think that the work that you're doing is starting to really look at this, not only in terms of the population of people that are, that are, that have had brain injuries, but also the, the professionals in there. Um, you know, I applaud you. It's, it's long overdue, but we, we've, we've had it before too. I think it's part of this continuum. I think we're getting better, better and better at it myself, so. Oops, uh, yes, and I, I'm hoping to, to evolve our uh, pink concussions to be yeah. um, more aligned with the diversity. But and Catherine, Catherine, when you went looking for people, you, you found people. Um, I just yeah. want to share really quickly. This is, um, we have about a, about a couple of minutes left. I just wanted to share with everyone um, uh, an event that, that we're having um, in, uh, at IDIA, uh, who is the host of this uh, group, a host, host of this. Uh, we're calling it Pink X. It's a three day event within IBIA. And it's their World Virtual Congress on Brain Injury. Um, Wednesday, there will be two tracks, one of which is pink concussions. And Thursday and Friday, there'll be four tracks, one of which is pink concussions. Um, one day is going to be why sex and gender differences in brain injury matter. And those will be sex and gender conversations and presentations with a, uh, a panel of women of lived experience. We'll have uh, Eve will be speaking with this, running it the um, Connecting Intimate Partner Violence in Women in Prison with Brain Injury. That'll be on Wednesday. Um, and then on Friday, we're having Understanding and Dismantling Systemic Barriers Faced by Black Women. And we're really excited about that conference. Um, 
And just to show you again, um, people that I've interviewed, Stephen Casper, Eve, wow. Lee, Necco, uh, Hugh Williams, this well, will be the Wednesday, which is the domestic violence and women in prison. This is Thursday, Kristen Dams O'Connor, John Letty, Mahim's been on our show, Rachel Rose's been on our show, Angela, Tina Masters, Monique, Eve, plus a patient panel. And then Friday, I'm really excited for this one. We'll have a patient a panel of people with lived experience, Deneen, Erica, Courtney, and Devang Madison, and Mason. And then we'll have Sydney Hines, Monique, Samira, and uh, Dr. Gary speaking in the afternoon on uh, understanding this. Is Devine on here as Mason? Did we? So that, that will Mason? be in July. So Mason. we hope everybody. Where do you say that? She just had a picture of um, it. Margaret. We can oh, oh sorry. You. Margaret. Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Hi. We just hear you talking. So. Oh, I'm that, sorry. The red. The registration is up for that and love to have people sign up. There is an early bird rate. And I really want to thank Ron. Ron, do you have any final closing moments that you'd well, like to I, share with the group? My, my, my boat is in uh, Sarasota, Florida. Usually, if I'm, I just came back from the Keys. Uh, but if you're in Sarasota, I'm at Marina Jack. And just come on in. And if I'm here, we'll, we'll, we'll go for a ride and do some fishing. That's awesome. <laughs> Ron, you're going to regret that because I'm actually going to go there July 30th to August 13th with my family. So there, get the boat. There, there you go. <laughs> Elena, do you want to share about your offering at the uh, IBIA World Congress? Do I want to share about my offering? Are you talking about um, the, uh, I think we have two presentations that uh, we've submitted. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Um, okay, Catherine, I didn't know you'd put me on the spot oh, like this. Sorry. Well, how about next week? Next week, I'd love to have you share. And what I want to start doing is having people, if, you pre if you're presenting at the IBIA event, either a poster or a symposium, just let me know that you want to share about what you have coming up, because I really want to promote everything that people are doing, promote uh, that people join this event. Um, if you're a trainee or a student or a person with lived experience. I think there's an $85 rate and that's for three days. Um, there's, I think a total of 16 CME hours. Um, all the pig concussions track the CME. So it's gonna be a great event. So how about next week, Elena, if you can join us, you can share about your sure. offerings. Sure, and I could tell you real quick, you know, but one of the big symposia I think that we're doing and Margaret, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're talking, we're tackling the neurologic, the sociologic, and the psychological effects of COVID-19, um, not just in our, in our healthcare industry, and not just you know, the, the physical effects, but the increase in intimate partner violence, the increase in suicide, you know, the increase in all of these secondary factors um, that need to be addressed and need to be looked at too. Well, that's awesome. I'm gonna just check uh, CME credits. Uh, the dates in July are the 27th, uh, I mean, no, the 28th, 29th, and 30th. It's a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, there are CMEs for therapists attending and social workers and doctors. And usually the pre-conference was an additional charge because it's virtual. The pre-conference is included in the whole package. So it's three days of, of events um, and CME credit. And we've uh, all of us have spent a lot of time on it. I know there are many names here of people that are contributing and speaking. So Drop me a line if you want to do, uh, we do have some time next week if you'd like to share about a poster, a symposium, or a panel that you're on. So thank you, Ron. It's lovely to have you, Marilyn, and have you speak. Uh, round of applause for Ron. Thank, thank you. you. And everybody have a safe and healthy week, and we'll see you next week. We have people that signed up all the way through September. So if you all keep showing up, we'll keep having the show. So thank you and everyone stay safe. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Good to see you, Ron.